We have laid a foundation for a consideration of mysticism in Islam by first looking at Muhammad the prophet as a mystic, then describing the exoteric form of Muslim life. We then looked at the mystical sect, the Shi'at Ali, whose understanding of authority as vested in the person of the prophet and whose tragic sense of loss and whose esoteric understanding of the Quran all provide a backdrop to the study of Sufism, the single dominant form of Islamic mysticism that will occupy us for the next series of lectures. We begin by taking up the appearance of Sufism in a religion that would, on the face of it, have least room for a life of interior questing. The appearance and the continued flourishing of Sufism as the dominant form of Islamic mysticism is simply a surprise to those who are unaware of the place that it holds in the history of this religious tradition. A hadith ascribed to the Prophet Muhammad declares there are no monks in Islam. And we saw that the Quran itself has a strong anti-ascetical tendency. It calls for marriage, for the holding of property, for political involvement. The month of fasting is for purposes of discipline, with each day's ending in eating and normal sexual behavior. The Sharia, the ordering of the Islamic people, the Ummah, through law, is developed and organized by scholars, the ulama, with little attention to the internal response of the individual. The ulama, furthermore, is closely connected to the power of the caliphate, and its main concern is the Islamic state more than the individual. The term theocracy, rule by God, is not a slander in this situation. External conformity is extremely important, and punishment for flagrant violations of community norms is swift and decisive. Seen from this perspective, Islam is a religion of the will, obedience, Islama, and of the mind, but not necessarily or obviously a religion of the heart. Sufism offers a powerful alternative way of being Muslim, both within and at the fringes of the Sharia. It places its entire emphasis on the individual's response to Allah through mind, heart, and mystical experience. It reflects a passionate desire for more than external conformity, a need to know and to love that which it regards as most real. Politically, Sufism's system of Sufi brotherhoods or orders offers a place not totally defined by the theocratic state. The Sufi brotherhood under the leadership of a sheikh offers a form of community that is closer and more intimate and more intentional. It is, if you will, closer to monasticism in Christianity, or perhaps a combination of monasticism and mendicant orders. Sufism's relationship to exoteric Islam has always been emphatic and debated. The ulama has not quite known what to do with Sufism. It has alternatively resisted it, it has tried to co-opt it, and that occasionally it has tried to reform it. At certain times and places, Sufism has represented the dominant expression of Islam in the world. This was above all during the years of the long decline in the caliphate between the 13th and 20th centuries. Sufism has also been one of the most powerful missionary impulses within Islam. Sufism is a form of religion that is so intrinsically attractive, at least in appearance, that it draws adherence. So even internally, given this um, odd relationship with the Sharia, the question arises as to the degree that Sufism is properly an expression 
of Islam? Or should it be better be seen as a universal mystical religion that is simply wearing the garb of Islam? We will return to this question in the last presentation in this unit. But at one level, it seems to me the answer is easy. However much elements are like other mystical traditions, classical Sufism is intricately bound up with the Quran and with the Sunnah of the Prophet. Now, the origins of Sufism, its causes and influences, remain to a large extent obscure and disputed. Sufism is generally thought to have arisen in Basra in Iraq in the 8th century, though some manifestations could in fact be earlier. Internally, Sufis tend to trace their origins either to Ali or to Abu Bakr. Abu Bakr is the first caliph after Muhammad in the Orthodox Caliphate, and the Naqshbandi order traces its origin to him. Most Sufi orders connect themselves to the figure of Ali. And we see here another way in which the mystical sect Shia and Sufi mysticism are linked through this connection to the esoteric caliph Ali. The etymology of the term Sufi is debated even within the tradition. Does it come from the noun Suf, which means wool, um, and perhaps refer to the garments worn by Sufis? Does it come from Safa, purity, indicating the process of purgation that Sufis go through? Does it come from Ashab or al Sufa, companions or people of the porch, referring to the gatherings of Sufis uh, in the Zawiya, in the precincts of the mosque? Or does it possibly come even from a transliteration of the Greek word Sophia, Sophia, meaning wisdom? These last two suggestions in particular that it comes from the people of the porch, like the ancient Stoic philosophers, or that it comes from the quest for wisdom, like Greek philosophers, suggests that the instinct is to find the origin of Sufism somehow outside Islam, because to many observers it seems such a surprising flower to grow in this soil. Scholars have thought about and tried to extricate possible factors in Sufism's origin. Could it have arisen from an influx of Neoplatonic philosophy or Gnostic groups? Um, and this might account for the tendency toward pantheism that we find in, in, among some Sufi teachers. Uh, we remember that there was a Gnostic sect in Iraq known as the Mandeans. Or could it come from Manichaeism, with its extraordinarily strong sense of dualism, the rejection of the body and the cultivation of the soul. Again, Manichaeism arrives, arises in Persia. Alternatively, perhaps it is the influence of Jewish groups with whom Muslims came in contact. We know that Iraq, Babylon was the center for Jewish life during these centuries, and that Jews, the rabbis, practiced Merkava mysticism. And so the notion of a heavenly ascent could be connected to that tradition. Or could it be contact with dissident Christian groups like the severely ascetical monks of East Syria, who, like the desert fathers, were very severe in their asceticism, wore simple clothing, and dedicated themselves to prayer. All of these external influences are possible. None can be proven. Others have suggested possibly it's a, it's a reaction to the rigidity of the Sharia, the rigidity of the external norms for life, and possibly also the corruption of the caliphate during the Umayyad dynasty. Islam is much too external and much too corrupt, and we need a personal transformation. That is possible, but perhaps most likely, the origin of Sufism is to be found 
in a universal impulse within all religions, and we have certainly seen it also in Judaism and Christianity, for a personal commitment to personal transformation. And in each of these traditions, that quest for personal transformation takes on the symbols of the tradition in which it finds itself. Like Islam itself, the basic components of the Sufi way of life are both simple and difficult. Sometimes we tend to think that the terms simple and easy correspond, and of course they do not. Sometimes that which is most simple is also most difficult. First, the Sufi conceives of him or herself as a traveler, somebody who seeks, and has set out on a path, a path that leads to contact with Allah. Here, the term shar, which we saw led to the development of law as sharia, and is found in the opening surah of the Quran, show us the path, the right path, shar, is appropriated by the Sufi. The path toward Allah, not externally, but internally. The path is driven through the self. The journey is the transformation of the self. So again, we find the external language of pilgrimage or journey used to describe what is actually a process of internal change. Now, the goal of this path is unity with that which is perceived as most real. The term is al-haq, that which is real, in contrast with that which is illusory. So the premises are twofold. First, that ordinary life, ordinary empirical existence, is not all there is. In fact, it camouflages what is most real. The empirical reality is the veil. Secondly, there is something better beyond the veil so that one must move past appearances to find what is most real. In order to follow the right path, the tariqat, toward God, dedication and discipline are required. The Sufi is not only somebody who desires to reach God, but is somebody who is devoted to that quest. All of the energies, all of the self, is dedicated to the transformation of the self. And this requires consistent practices that go to reshape the self. In order to accomplish this, the Sufi orders, the tariqas, provide the social framework for the seeker to move securely in the path. Because obviously all paths of personal self-transformation are liable to delusion. Um, and our people, the more people work interiorly, the more confused they certainly can become. This is why the role of the sheikh, the spiritual leader within the Sufi brotherhood, is all important. The sheikh has to be somebody who has already gone to the place the Sufi is seeking. The sheikh is a spiritual director with absolute authority. So obedience to the sheikh is, in a sense, as obedience to Allah. The sheikh, in many ways, resembles the imam in the Shiat Ali. And the sheikh often then is perceived as participating in sainthood, indeed participating in al-haq, the reality that is most real, perhaps even at times a revelation of what is most real, a divine presence. So the sheikh instructs, directs, challenges the murid, the disciple. And this relationship is decisive. The brotherhood meets in the zawiya, which is a simple room. It may be part of a mosque, it may be a private house, but what, what makes a zawiya a zawiya is that it is the place where the brotherhood meets to read the Qur'an, to study, and to engage in prayer. 
The communal structure of these brotherhoods that can number in the hundreds and even thousands provide support for the seeker. Mutual service is practiced and mutual correction is practiced. The Sufi is on a safe path because the Sufi travels with others and is led by a guide who has already reached where the Sufi wants to go. The Sufi follows a threefold path of self-transformation involving knowledge, love, and prayer as he or she moves toward union with Al-Haq. Knowledge can include both Esoteric knowledge concerning the ascent, it is a form of gnosis about what happens, for example, in stages of ecstasy, um, or it can include theosophical knowledge about the relationship of the self to God. It is in this last form of knowledge that we find elements of Gnosticism and pantheism, um, that um, it, it is in this last form of knowledge that elements of Gnosticism and pantheism are likely to appear. The Sufi also cultivates an emotional response of love as well as external obedience. So we find the striking words of Rabia al adawiya a very important early female Sufi, I love thee with two loves, speaking to Allah, love of my happiness and perfect love, to love thee as is thy due. My selfish love is that I do naught but think on thee, excluding all beside. But that purest love which is thy due is that the veils which hide thee fall, and I gaze on thee. No praise to me in either this or that, nay thine the praise, for both that love and this. In this quest of love, the use of erotic language to express the love of Allah is not uncommon. Thus we find in a, a, a paragraph drawn from Ibn al-Arabi, O oh, her beauty, the tender maid, its brilliance gives light like lamps to one traveling in the dark, she is a pearl hidden in a shell of hair as black as jet, a pearl for which thought dives and remains unceasingly in that ocean. He who looks upon her deems her to be a gazelle of the sandhills because of her shapely neck and the loveliness of her gestures. Knowledge and love. But most of all, the Sufi's life is characterized by prayer. And the characteristic prayer of the Sufi is recollection, thicker. Recollection, as we saw in those Spanish mystics like Francisco de Esuna, who had been in contact with uh, Sufi mysticism, is a collecting of the self, a form of concentration. Sometimes it employs the use of music, sawa. Very often, it involves the recitation of the names of Allah um, and the turning over of prayer beads as a technique of counting off the names of Allah. So a typical Sufi collection um, consists in the 99 names of Allah each name is drawn from an attribute ascribed to Allah um, in the Quran. Allah, the name that is above every name. Al-Awal, the first, who was before the beginning. Al-Akhir, the last, who will still be after all has ended. Al-Badi, the contriver, who contrive the whole art of creation, al Bari, the maker, from whose hand we are all come, al Rahman, the merciful, the most merciful of those who show mercy, al Rahim, the compassionate, who is gentle and full of compassion, and, and thus through the ninety-nine names of Allah, it is uh, probably correct. That Christianity drew the inspiration for the rosary 
from this practice of counting off the names of Allah on prayer beads. We are also reminded of the way in which the name of Jesus is used in hesychastic prayer in Eastern Orthodoxy. So knowledge, love, and prayer. How does the Sufi progress? The Sufi's progress is marked by definite stages. They can be called stages or stations. And the image is that of a caravan that is moving from oasis to oasis. The stations or stages on the path to Allah um, result from human effort. These are the things that the human can do within the self um, on the way. So we find um, in Asaraj, excuse me, Kushairi, describing what a station is. The station is the particular place along the path of refinement realized by the God servant through a kind of behavior and through a form of quest and self-discipline. A person's station is his standing in such matters and the practices in which he is engaged. And now here's a very important point. An essential condition of the station is that you cannot rise from one station to another until you have fulfilled the provisions of the first. Just as on a journey, you can't overleap one stop on the journey. You have to complete that stage before you can move to another. So he says, whoever has not attained contentedness is not ready for the station of trust in God. Whoever has not attained trust in God is not ready for the station of surrender. Similarly, whoever has not attained repentance is not ready for contrition. And whoever has not attained watchfulness is not ready for renunciation. So we can begin to see what are the actual practices and disciplines that the Sufi engages in as these stations that bring uh, him or her closer uh, to Allah. Repentance is almost always listed as the first. The abandonment of one's conscious sins, first of all. And secondly, the firm resolve that one will not return to these sins in the future. And if one fails to keep that vow, one needs to start over. One has not accomplished that station. So it begins by withdrawing from sin. A certain well-known Sufi repented 70 times and fell back into sin 70 times before he made a lasting repentance. But the effort must be made to keep moving. There is a saying ascribed again to the female Sufi Rabia, where somebody said to her, I have committed many sins. If I turn in penitence towards God, will he in turn, excuse me, will he turn in mercy towards me? Nay, she replied, but if he shall turn towards thee, thou wilt turn towards him. This is a striking statement because even though the stations result from human accomplishment, what Rabia points out is that Allah's power is at work in the entire process. Even the human effort results from the gift of Allah. Another station is that of watchfulness. Khujwuri says, when a novice joins them with the purpose of renouncing the world, they subject him to spiritual discipline for the space of three years. So if a candidate presents himself at a zawiya, there is a three-year probationary period. The first year is devoted to the service of the people, or folk as they are often called. You serve the community. The second year, to service of God. And the third year, to watching over his own heart. He can watch over his own heart, Hujwiri continues, only when his thoughts are collected and every care is dismissed, so that in communion with God, he guards his heart from the assaults of heedlessness. It's a constant watchfulness. So when the novice completes these qualifications, he can be robed and join 
the rest of the community and not be treated as an outsider. Another very important station is the station of renunciation. It begins, first of all, with a lack of possessions. So we have here the terms fakir, a poor man, um, and dervish, who is a beggar. So the Sufi tries to live with as few necessary items as possible. Perhaps a blanket, perhaps a mat, perhaps a clay pot, but nothing more. And begs from others. But the greater degree of renunciation is to, uh, to gain lack of desire to have things. The poor man and the mendicant are names by which the Muslim mystic is proud to be known because they imply that he is stripped of every thought or wish that would divert his mind from God. And there are a number of maxims that are devoted to begging. One reads, do not beg unless you are starving. The Caliph Omar flogged a man who begged after having satisfied his hunger. When compelled to beg, do not accept more than you need. At a deeper level still, we have mortification, the putting to death of the passions, the lusts that are called nafs, fighting this internal battle against temptation. This reminds us very much of what we saw in the Desert Fathers. Mortification reaches its high point when one actually puts the self to death. But the point of putting that self to death, those unruly passions, is really so that one lives to God. A very important station is that of absolute trust in Allah. This means that while you speak and act in the sincere belief that there is no God except Him, you should trust Him more than the world or money or uncle or father or mother or anyone on the face of the earth. That is a line from Shakik of Balk. Finally, then, there is the constant prayer of recollection that moves one along on this path. Now, if stages or stations result from the practice of what in Christian mysticism would be called asceticism, this steady discipline, renouncing possessions, renouncing internal passions, and so forth. The other key term is states, or hal. The state is a gift from Allah over which the Sufi has no control. So we read in Kushairi, among the folk, that is among the Sufis, the state is a mode of consciousness that comes upon the heart without a person's intending it, attracting it or trying to gain it, a feeling of delight or sorrow, constriction, longing, anxiety, terror or want. States are bestowed, stations are attained. States come freely given, while stations are gained with the expending of effort. The possessor of a station is secure in his station, while the possessor of a state can be taken up out of his state. So these are the actual, the states are the actual psychological experiences. Sometimes the term flashes is used. States of ecstasy, but we, we see that they also include states of deep anxiety, states of fear, states of longing. The two highest states that are gifted by Allah are fana, the passing away, sometimes called annihilation, where one loses the sense of oneself in Allah. And then, fascinatingly, fana al fana, passing away of passing away, in which the mystic is so united with Allah that there is not the sense of intermittent experiences, but rather persistence in a state. Like mysticism in Judaism and Christianity, but perhaps even more dramatically, 
Sufism has posed problems for the exoteric tradition in Islam. At the theoretical level, the tendency of Sufi, monothe uh, Sufi monotheism to move toward pantheism, the esoteric reading of the Quran, and the exaltation of saints can all erode the Sharia and even the Shahada. At the practical level, the cultivation of the saints has given rise to a number of problematic associations, and the power of the Sufi brotherhoods always challenges the authority of the ulama.